talk about cardiomyopathy in pregnancy. And I love this topic because there's some neat new stuff happening. I'm going to stay on topic if I can. So Brianna went through this schema of what happens in pregnancy. And this is super important when we talk about cardiomyopathy because cardiomyopathy can come in all flavors. The one you think about in pregnancy is you think of peripartum cardiomyopathy, right? Well, I'm just going to cut to the chase at the beginning of this talk because this slide is super important. So early on at early stage of pregnancy, you get a ramp up when the fetus is, you know, less than 12 weeks. The baby's this big. It's not giving you much hemodynamic de demands unless it's making you so sick that you can't get your hemodynamics in, in line because you're so dehydrated. And we see women like that and they need to be admitted for fluids, okay? But in general, the first trimester of pregnancy, your body's just kind of getting used to, there's something weird going on in my body. The second trimester, there's a serious ramp up because the baby starts to actually grow to be a size that actually has some hemodynamic compromise on the maternal system. So during the second trimester, there is this ramp up in volume, okay? So how does your heart manifest the, the skill sets it's required to, you know, nourish a fetus that's going to require 40 to 50% extra blood volume, okay? And it does it by several mechanisms. One, the placenta itself has low vascular resistance because that circuitry is open, right? The blood vessels between mom and baby are like full-on baby steals from you, okay? That drops the overall vascular resistance all the way through pregnancy. In fact, vascular resistance goes up pretty dramatically when you take the placenta out at birth, okay? The stroke volume, volume that's in the blood vessels, climbs dramatically and peaks really at like 30 weeks of gestation. So during this period of the second trimester, baby's not that big, but the hemodynamic effects of that baby are pretty, pretty juicy. And I see quite a few number of, of quite a few patients who are pregnant. Mostly they're seeking consultation in the second trimester because they have symptoms of I'm short of breath, I have palpitations. And really 90% of these patients really just have symptoms of this stress to their cardiovascular system but this is important. The stress of the cardiovascular system really puts the heart under stress in the second trimester, okay? So if you've got a problem with your heart, you're gonna show up with shortness of breath, palpitations, hypoxic, heart failure in the second trimester if there's something wrong with you. So one of the reasons that I get to see so many of these like hopeful, young, and healthy patients, which I love to see on Fridays because it reminds me of what the world's really like before the weekend, that they are easy to fix because, well, there's nothing wrong with them. You make sure their heart's structurally normal and that their blood pressure is good and they don't have any other um, cardiac concerns, and they're just back to the OBGYN with a bunch of reassurance and a copy of their echocardiogram report and that they don't have WPW, and they're gone. They don't come back to you. You just tell them to make sure they drink a lot of fluid, stay off their side, and they're good. So second trimester is when you show up if you have an abnormality of your heart. But peripartum cardiomyopathy usually presents in like 80 to 90% of the cases within one month of delivery, okay? So if you had something wrong with your heart early on, these patients would have shown up earlier. So the timing of the presentation kind of helps to tease out what's the cause of the heart failure. It's not perfect, but it's kind of good. So what about heart failure in pregnancy? Well, heart failure in pregnancy is really quite rare. As I said, most of these patients are just normal and they're having physiological changes that are manifesting as shortness of breath. About 60 to 70% of pregnant women complain of shortness of breath. I mean, it's just a fact that when you're pregnant, you're mostly going to have people that are short of breath and you're going to have to figure out when to get worried, okay? Some people get worried earlier than we do because we're used to kind of seeing a lot of badness. But the output of the cardiac output goes up in the last stages of pregnancy, which increases the risk for heart failure. 
So in patients with pre-existing cardiomyopathy, idiopathic, or what we call dilated, but it doesn't have to be dilated, infectious, valvular, or drug-associated, like you've had anthracyclines or adriamycin, that's the most common cause of heart failure in pregnancy. Actually, probably the most common cause of heart failure in pregnancy is you're a normal person and somebody gave you way too much salt somewhere close to delivery, but your function of your heart is normal, okay? Um, the timing of decompensation, I've just explained. If it occurs in the second trimester or early, it's usually that you've got a pre-existing cardiomyopathic process because peripartum cardiomyopathy is almost always the last trimester with the, really the, la the, month, the last month of pregnancy. So what about pre-existing cardiomyopathies? Well, this is actually important because as women have grown older in the childbirthing process, now women are ha come and because the congenital heart disease surgery and treatment has become so good, women that previously would have never had a baby are now having babies with IVF, okay? And congenital heart disease, I mean, we have Fontans that get pregnant now. And in the olden days, you know, Fontan, patients didn't get a Fontan, they didn't even survive into adulthood. And now we have these people that are now palliated and have abnormal hearts that really want to have a baby. And, you know, the IVF people, they're more than willing to respond to that. So we've got an excess risk of patients that really drive the risk for maternal mortality as women have gotten older for multiple reasons. So primary or dilated cardiomyopathies are, um, have symptoms of heart failure, obviously, and evidence of LV systolic dysfunction without evidence of abnormalities of hypertrophy. So they're not a hypertroph and they're not a dilated cardiomyopathy. I mean, they are a, a no-valve disease. Usually patients that have class two to four heart failure develop, have an EF less than 45% and are at the greatest risk for decompensation. And these women should avoid pregnancy. So if the EF pre-pregnancy is less than 45, they should not get pregnant, okay? A woman, however, that shows up pregnant with an EF less than 20 should have the pregnancy terminated, okay? Because the volume of pregnancy, 40 to 60% increase is going to be very bad on a heart that's already not able to sustain life for the mother. Okay, those dilated cardiomyopathies are really unfortunate, okay? And you usually know that the patient has it. Every now and then we get a hypertroph that's pregnant and they didn't know they were a hypertroph, okay? They may not have known they had a family history. It may be a sporadic mutation. But remember, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an autosomal dominant condition. One in 500 white people carry the gene. It's common, okay? Many people don't even know they have it, okay? The definition of um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I put this in for you, Dr. Livesey, is that you have unexplained hypertrophy Okay, in any wall, it doesn't have to just be the septum. You probably heard of the term ASH or asymmetric septal hypertrophy. That is one variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but any level of hypertrophy that's unexplained, meaning it's not because you had high blood pressure or aortic stenosis or a VSD or coarctation, it's unexplained, is usually a phenotypic expression of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Remember that the abnormalities of diastolic function occur in the absence or before people get hypertrophy. Um, and the diastolic abnormalities become a phenotypic expression of there's something wrong with my heart. So if you're looking to screen family members with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the thing we look for is hypertrophy and abnormalities of diastolic performance. Okay. Not genetic testing, right? It's the echo. So what are the symptoms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, they depend on several things. The pattern of hypertrophy. So if the septum is predominantly hypertrophied, it will produce the most outflow tract abnormalities, which will produce the most obstruction, mitral regurgitation, the worst diastolic dysfunction, and the most symptoms early. Apical hypertrophs generally have um, hypertrophy limited to the apex, which really go kind of unnoticed. Um, people show up with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because they have a funny EKG.
honestly. The EKGs are, that Eunice showed that one today with the deep T-wave inversions, and I wasn't paying attention because I was taking notes. And then I looked up and I saw the EKG, and the first thing I thought of was, well, because I'm not a coronary maven, is I thought, oh my God, do they have apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Because that's a typical pattern. So if you see an EKG like that, and the, e and the echo doesn't show much concentric hypertrophy, the apex may not be showing you how much hypertrophy there really is. You may need contrast, a better echocardiographer, or an MRI. Okay. So the severity of the outflow tract obstruction determines symptoms. The severity of the diastolic dysfunction, which tells you something about the, the longevity of the um, diastolic abnormalities or, and or the significance of the outflow tract obstruction and whether or not they have AFib. Okay, AFib and VT um, are um, certainly um, going to cause symptoms and late systolic dysfunction is very it's really uncommon in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In fact, most people that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have a normal life expectancy because they don't really get systolic dysfunction until very late in the pathway. Um, pregnant women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may present with new onset symptoms of heart failure, arrhythmia, or an asymptomatic murmur of outflow tract obstruction in pregnancy. This was actually a question on the boards. I had to retake, recertify for the boards this year, and all the fellows walked out talking about this question about the hypertroph who was pregnant and the question they asked on the board, I can't remember the whole thing, but it was something like, patient is symptomatic with, um, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, do you terminate the pregnancy, is this well, you know, symptoms are well controlled in pregnancy, and I was like, oh my God, it's a hypertroph. What happens in hypertrophs? Hypertrophs have a problem when the ventricle is really small, but pregnancy increases the volume by 40 to 60 percent. So what do you think normally happens in pregnancy? Hypertrophs get better. They get a bigger volume. They have less outflow tract obstruction. And really, you don't need to worry about the patient that's a hypertroph in pregnancy unless they have something really critical. So in general, they handle pregnancy quite well. The only problem is they're just given their genetic code to the fetus, and they've got a 50-50 chance of yielding these um, hypertrophic genes. So patients that are hypertrophs have an increased risk of sudden death, heart failure, and stroke. The high-risk features are a, a history of sudden cardiac arrest or ventricular arrhythmia, severe hypertrophy greater than three centimeters, and a family history of sudden cardiac death unexplained syncope. Now, we get all excited in the cardiology world about unexplained syncope, even in hypertrophs, but it's generally that they a, got dehydrated or they took too many medications, but they certainly definitely need a workup. Non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in people younger than 30s and age at presentation less than 30 is certainly an increased risk. So I already gave away the speech. You know, pregnancy does well with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because um, pregnancy in proves the hemodynamics that favor better outflow emptying in, in patients that have um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, now we get to the big guy, the big daddy, acquired peripartum cardiomyopathy. And why is it important? Well, there's a lot of research going on about um, peripartum cardiomyopathy because it can be quite lethal um, if you miss it. Um, the definition is that you have to have symptomatic heart failure, so you have to have um, um, shortness of breath, rouse, hypoxia, et cetera. You have to have, and this is important, the original definition of, of peripartum cardiomyopathy, 1971. Okay, it wasn't like 100 years ago. We're talking 40 years ago, not that many years ago, that people first described peripartum cardiomyopathy. At that time, they were just diagnosing it as symptomatic heart failure. It, it included a big category of like anybody who got salt loaded. You get it? A working group in 1991 decided, you know, we need to put a limitation on the EF, and they mandated that the systolic function had to be abnormal to be able to call it um, peripartum cardiomyopathy. And you can't have any other reason for heart failure, meaning you can't have the Barlow valve, or a bicuspid aortic valve, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or previous cardiomyopathy, or hyperthyroid. So the key, and this is important, the definition for um, peripartum cardiomyopathy is by definition a broad definition, okay? You can see it's not like too pedantic. 
the onset of symptoms is really related to how severe is the myopathic process and how rapidly did it decline, decline, okay? So if you have a really, really bad acquired cardiomyopathy in pregnancy that occurs earlier in the pregnancy, it may still be peripartum cardiomyopathy. You see what I'm saying? You just don't have a snapshot of what this woman looked like before. And the outcomes between early onset peripartum and late onset peripartum, they're the same. So it's usually, and I think I have a slide here, um, I'm going to show it in a second, where you see all the cases of peripartum cardiomyopathy presenting right around the month of delivery. But if you have a patient that fits the bill early on and they didn't have any symptoms before, they may still be a peripartum cardiomyopathy. It's really a diagnosis of exclusion, okay? So the symptoms of heart failure without any underlying heart failure. Non-invasive imaging, you must show a documentation of a reduction in the EF. It's usually done by echocardiography. I mean, people aren't really too eager to put pregnant people in the CT scanner. We put people in the, in the MRI with impunity. Here's the slide I was looking for. Now, this is a complicated slide because this shows weeks of gestation. These blue dots are the incidence of peripartum cardiomyopathy. And you can see, like, the lion's share is within one to four weeks of delivery. So it's usually really a good name, peripartum cardiomyopathy, because partum means delivery. These slides also show you in black the changes, the hemodynamic changes that occur in pregnancy. And clearly you can see that these hemodynamic changes have vigorously predated the onset of the cardiomyopathy. So it's hard to say that the hemodynamic stress is what caused the cardiomyopathy, right? The hemodynamic stress may unmask the cardiomyopathy if somebody has a secondary cause or another cause for cardiomyopathy, but you would expect that to be unmasked way back here, right? Cool. Then the second thing that this shows is the levels of prolactin in the soluble um, marker that both of these hormones are presumed to be involved in the etiology of peripartum cardiomyopathy. And this slide shows the development and the increase of these hormones. Prolactin comes from the pituitary gland, and this soluble tyrosine um, molecule comes from the placenta. And so you can see that these levels rise predating the, the um development of cardiomyopathy and fall rapidly after delivery, which some believe may be part of the reason why so many of these patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy recover from cardiomyopathy because the offending etiological agents are being removed naturally by the body after pregnancy. Okay, so what's the incidence of peripartum cardiomyopathy? Well, guess what? It, it varies quite a lot based on geography and socioeconomic class and by race. So the lowest incidence in the world is in Japan, 1 in 20,000. It's the highest in Nigeria and Haiti for a lot of reasons, but as high as 1 in 100. I mean, we are talking a lot of peripartum cardiomyopathy. The U.S., in general, we think it's about 1 in 4,000, but it's increasing. Why is it increasing? Ah, multiple gestations, preeclampsia, older age. Those are the things that increase it. So the incidence is increasing. It used to be about 8.5 cases per 10,000. Now it's up to almost 12 in 2011. Possibly related to we have more awareness. We're not ignoring women. Acts, because if you ignore them and they have a mild cardiomyopathy, they may just get better on their own and you never knew they had a peripartum cardiomyopathy, right? You might not know. There's a lot more access to diagnostic imaging. Tell me about it. We got people in this hospital running around with diagnostic echoes that are this big. I need one. Um, advanced maternal age, multiple gestation, and preeclampsia on the rise. The highest risk group are women who are over 30. We're old. African Americans, people with preeclampsia, hypertension, and multiple gestations. So 50% of peripartum cardiomyopathy occur in women over 30 years of age. And people over 40 years of age, when they have a baby, are at a tenfold increased risk of peripartum cardiomyopathy compared to somebody age 20 or less. So globally, if we look at 
meta-analysis because there aren't enough big centers with cardiomyopathy in pregnancy, okay? They're, they're just not. So what they've done is they've cobbled together some consortium. The biggest meta-analysis includes 979 women with peripartum cardiomyopathy, and they found that preeclampsia was prevalent in about 22% of the population that had peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is about four to five times what you'd expect in the background population. The prevalence of hypertension was 37%, which is quite high. And in this global analysis, there was not that much of an association with race or gender. When they looked at the same factors in the United States, they had 535 women in a cohort in six states, and they showed similar rates of preeclampsia and hypertension, which pretty much tells you that there's something with the hypertensive mom that leads to or influences the likelihood of being susceptible to peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, the thought is that preeclampsia is associated with the predisposition to cardiomyopathy through a shared pathophysiologic mechanism that's independent of race and geography. So what, I love this slide the most, because it took me so long to figure it out. I had to, I had to write a book chapter for Dr. Willerson and I was, went a little crazy on this section because, well, it's so entertaining and there's so many new findings and it has an, an impact on how we might treat women. So being a woman provider and there's so few women heart doctors, we're 12% that we need to know every, I felt like I had to know everything about it. So I tried to learn everything I could. So hemodynamic stress is considered to be originally one of the reasons why peripartum cardiomyopathy was caused. I don't buy that at all because the presentation doesn't fit with, it just doesn't fit with the outcome. Selenium deficiency is actually probably a cause for cardiomyopathy in sub-Saharan Africa because of um, nutrients. Um, and that may compound the reason why um, some African nations have such high levels of peripartum cardiomyopathy. But when it's been looked in non-African sub-Saharan countries, selenium deficiency is not a cause for peripartum cardiomyopathy in our part of the world. Genetics probably plays a role. Probably plays a role by providing the substrate for which whatever the second hit comes along and influences. Most women that have peripartum cardiomyopathy have no family history of peripartum cardiomyopathy or any kind of a dilated cardiomyopathy. However, there are small familial clusters of peripartum cardiomyopathy and they cluster with dilated cardiomyopathy. There may be a genetic susceptibility um, in a subset of um, African American um, or women of African descent and then there's this whole thing about a Titan gene, which is a sarcomere protein that influences the risk for peripartum, peripartum cardiomyopathy that's not associated with hypertension. So peripartum cardiomyopathy may be the subset of a big group, and there may be multiple etiologies, right? That's what I'm beginning to think. The thing that you need to know is there's probably some input, impact of hormones that are coming from the mother, either from her pituitary gland or from her placenta, that interact in susceptible hosts, the, right, the mom with the right genetic code, to induce vascular injury, okay? The vascular injury is what leads to the cardiomyopathy. Now, remember that at birth, the mom has to go from having a hormonal milieu that's eager for blood to move, so no clotting. You go from a, I'm not going to clot in this blood vessel to, I got to clot because I'm if I don't clot when I deliver this baby, I'm going to bleed to death. And there are triggers in the maternal circulation that turn the switches off so that the mom's body is getting ready to deliver. Okay, so this angiogenic balance can be local in the placenta or in the heart, or it can be coming from the pituitary gland for the whole body. So the thought is that there are these anti-angiogenic factors that have been documented in two mouse models, I swear, to cause cardiomyopathy experimentally. In addition, we know that the anti-VEGF chemotherapy, I can't say the name, but it's Avastin. That's the name you can say, Beva 
Sisamab. I get it. Is an anti-VEGF chemotherapeutic agent used for breast, ovarian, lung cancer, leads to cardiomyopathy. Okay. So there is experimental evidence that if you block VEGF, you can induce a cardiomyopathy in, in men and in women. So what are the two antiangiogenic hormones that are present in the maternal circulation that peak at the end of pregnancy? Well, one's prolactin and one soluble variant of the vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, which comes from the placenta. These levels of the soluble VEGF um, receptor variant are increased in women with pericardium cardiomyopathy. They're increased in preeclampsia, and they're coming from the placenta. So if you have multiple gestations, you have multiple placenta, you know, bigger placenta, you're making more of this stuff. The levels are correlated with heart failure symptoms and outcome in women with pericardium cardiomyopathy. In the most important study of pericardium cardiomyopathy, which is called IPAC, which was between, it was a friend of mine who started the study at the Toronto um, hospital, and they have enrolled 100 women and prospectively followed them with serial, timely echoes, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. But the hormonal vascular theory in pericardium cardiomyopathy is such that these hormones, oh, I've lost it. At, once they're emitted into the central circulation, they set up a cascade of chemical factors that lead to apoptosis, capillary dissociation, and vasoconstriction. Okay? And if you block the chemicals with bromocryptine or you rescue the animal with lot with VEGF, you can reverse the cardiomyopathy, okay? So there's hope for, well, one of the other things I want to say is, first thing that women do when they deliver a baby, if they have a terrible cardiomyopathy and they have terrible heart failure, is they stop breastfeeding, okay? Because they're too sick to breastfeed. And stopping the breastfeeding may actually drop the prolactin levels and aid in the recovery of these patients. Okay, what are the prognosis? Well, the maternal risks are death, cardiac arrest, need for heart transplantation, mechanical circulatory support to get you over the hump, fulminant heart failure, and thromboembolic events. I mean, really, you can die. Retrospective review showed that 36% of women that develop pericardium cardiomyopathy experienced a major adverse cardiac event. So it's serious stuff. The IPAC is this prospective study of 100 women followed for 12 months. 13% of these women had a major vascular event or persistent cardiomyopathy with an EF less than 35. But the good news in IPAC was that 72% of these women had complete recovery. And if you recover and you're not African American, you recover quickly. Okay? So what about the mortality? Mortality rates vary because of the, the racial pattern of peripartum cardiomyopathy. So in the U.S., in hospital mortality is only 1.3%, but after seven to eight years of follow-up, it may be as high as 16%. So you may get out of the hospital, but you've been left with a smoldering cardiomyopathic process. It's a leading cause of maternal death in California with a, basically a quarter of the deaths, and the prognostic adverse risk factors for maternal death include a higher New York Heart Association class, an EF less than 30, African-American um, race, and age over 30. So neonatal and obstetrical outcomes, they're abnormal too. 40% of women that have it got a C-section. Stillbirth occurred in almost 4%. In IPAC, there were 2% 2, 2 stillbirths, one neonatal death, and four babies with congenital anomalies. Um, they have lower mean birth weights, at birth scars, and the timing of delivery is just based on how's the mom and the baby doing. So LV recovery is super important. So LV recovery in peripartum cardiomyopathy is greater in women with peripartum than in non-peripartum cardiomyopathy. Peripartum, we, the way we look at peripartum cardiomyopathy is that if you have it, it's better than having a regular cardiomyopathy if you don't die from it right up front because you're more likely to recover. Partial or complete recovery, it depends on the group that you're looking at. In IPAC, it was 72%, but in a cohort from... Um, South Africa, it was only 42%, but that was predominantly an, Afri an Af African um, um, black genetic predisposition. So in IPAC study, that's American and Canada, Canadian prospective study, 
we talked about it. 13% had adverse events in one year, 15% had a partial recovery, and 72% recovered completely. So, I mean, mostly they do pretty well. Um, most recover fully within six months. In fact, 75% of those that recover fully do so within the first two months. So if you're watching the patient, you should watch them recover kind of quickly. The predictors of recovery, the most important predictor of recovery is what's the EF at presentation. If the EF is, if the EF is less than 30 or the LV dimension is greater than six, they have a low rate of recovery. But if they have it better than six, less than six and greater than 30, 91% improve. So poor recovery, low EF, less than 30, internal dimension of the LV and diastole of six, a late diagnosis, LV thrombus or black race are risk factors for poor recovery. So here's the comment about the LVID and the EF. So if you have a good LVID and an EF greater than 30, full recovery occurs in 91%. If you have neither, no one gets a full recovery. So you can tell at the very beginning when you see the woman what the prognosis is based on echocardiographic measurements at the time you make the diagnosis. If the EF is greater than 30 at presentation, you have an 86% full recovery compared to those with an EF less than 30, 37%. In the lowest EFs at presentation, 30% of women failed to recover to over 30%, and 63% failed to recover over 50%. But see, even in that very, very poor EF group, 10 to 20%, 37 of those percent of those women completely recovered. Okay. So what about relapse with subsequent pregnancy? So there, these are women and peripartum cardiomyopathy may occur with the first pregnancy. If the heart completely recovers, the next thing she's going to ask is when can I have another baby? And I understand that because I have two children. I'm not sure I could do more, but Relapse rates or a decline in the LVEF double are double when women fail to recover. So if you have a woman who fails to recover her EF greater than 50, her risk of having a decline in her EF from whatever she is, is 48%. Okay, the mortality in this group may be as high as 16%. And that's in America. In other countries, it may be quite a bit higher. Okay. But normalization of EF does not predict a risk-free second pregnancy. Um, many people still go on to develop heart failure, and a quarter of them had a fall in the EF more than 20 points. So what about the treatment for peripartum cardiomyopathy? How mad am I doing? It's basically follow the guidelines for regular cardiomyopathy treatment. Diuretics, IV or oral vasodilators. So in African Americans, that may be hydralazine and, and, and nitrates. If the patient is no longer pregnant and not breastfeeding, it may it should include ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Beta blockers can be given for women that are not in fulminant heart failure. Mineralocorticoid inhibitors are okay. And digoxin is still used, although we don't really think it does much good, but the OBs love it. Um, the key is to treat to improve stroke volume and cardiac output. Digoxin use is safe in pregnancy. It's not that useful, but you may need a higher dose because of the volume of distribution in pregnancy. And then I think I'm going to just show you a pretty picture of what a clot looks like. So peripartum cardiomyopathy, certainly when it's severe, has a higher risk of clotting because the pregnancy state is a you know, thromboembolic milieu for clotting. So these women need basically heparin until they deliver um, or until the clot is gone and the EF has um, improved. The risk for stroke is, you know, between 1 and 12%. Um, it, um, embolic events are real. And since it occurs, the peripartum cardiomyopathy occurs a clay late in pregnancy, we really kind of like to use heparin because you can turn it on and turn it off. Postpartum, you may want to use warfarin. Um, Important to note, because we're going to talk about novel treatments, that bromocryptine, which will inhibit the, release, the conversion of prolactin from the pituitary gland to an active and compelling hormone, was used in the 70s and is, was free on the market to help dry up the mother's milk. 
and it was associated with an increased risk of stroke and heart attacks. And for that reason, it really isn't used today. Okay, so you've got a, a drug that you might think might be beneficial for pregnant women with peripartum cardiomyopathy. You need to think if you use it, maybe it has some hypercoagulable properties. So that brings us to the slide that talks about possibly in the future people are experimenting with using bromocryptine. No randomized trials have been done. There were two trials from Germany and in neither trial was there a, a competent control group. So quite honestly, if, if I had a patient that was critically ill and all the therapies were failing, would I pull out the bromocryptine? Beyond a doubt. So the other important thing is that after recovery, and you're on a woman with a woman with recovery of LV function on cardiomyopathic medications. The rule is that the woman should stay on the medicines for at least 12 months after the presentation and for six months following complete LV recovery. And then the medications should be withdrawn one at a time while surveying the symptoms and annually looking at the echo to make sure that the function of the heart is um, still okay. If you said to me, she's doing well on the medicines, should we leave them on the medicines? I'm okay with that too. Um, the only other important thing is that because these cardiomyopathies tend to improve if they're going to quite rapidly, before an AICD is put into the patient at a young age, which is going to require a lot of battery changes and a lot of extra cost, you might consider wearing a, a life vest to assess and to treat for um, lethal arrhythmias if you think that the function of the heart is going to improve. So I think delivery is really just based on the needs of the baby and the mom. I think I'm going breastfeeding, and I'm over time, breastfeeding has actually been looked at as a culprit for not a good risk for mom with continued prolactin levels but overall the message from the WHO which is basically going to support women who are breastfeeding in third world nations where there's no other food for babies has come out with a consensus statement saying that breastfeeding should be continued because in some countries no breastfeeding means baby may not survive so most people with peripartum cardiomyopathy get better on their own anyway only in the ones that are very severely impaired would I recommend that the breastfeeding be stopped. And remember that ARBs should be avoided because they are excreted in the breast milk. And remember that in women that are postpartum from a peripartum cardiomyopathy, they are still at increased risk for thromboembolic events. And we should recommend contraceptive devices that are non-estrogen containing. So maybe progestin depot or IUDs or sterilization are recommended in these women. And I think I'm going to turn it over there. And I'm so sorry I went over a little bit. Um, what's the, all right, that, we're supposed to take a break. Yeah.